We're going to speak tonight on a demonstration of the validity of the Scriptures in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Introduction to the resurrection. In Romans 10.9 it says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay, so this is what the Scriptures have to say. It says that if we confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. It never says that we have to believe in Adam and Eve. It never says that we have to believe in the virgin birth. It never says that we have to believe in Satan or in angels, though you might want to because Jesus certainly spoke of all of this as if it were true. But what the Scriptures say is that critical for salvation is believing that God has raised Jesus from the dead. That is critical for salvation. So you can't, I can't just say, oh, well, I've been born in America. You know, Americans are Christians. We're all Christians. You know, I'm good to go. You're good to go. That's not what the scriptures say. That might be your interpretation. That's fine. Believe whatever you want to believe. But if we want to be consistent with the scriptures, He puts before us that we have to believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead. How could anyone believe in a physical resurrection? How could any thinking man or woman believe in a physical resurrection? Unless God provides sufficient evidence to us, as well as a testimony to our hearts by the Spirit. But you see, this is a critical aspect to believe in the physical resurrection. Very often I will invite... My, my professor colleagues to the Cohen house for lunch. And as soon as we sit down, I say to them, do you believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ? <laughs> because I just want to know where they're at. And based on their answer to that, I know where they are. And so then I know how to, how to engage with them. I just want to know. It's, just, it's a fair question. And, and uh, one time a student came up to me and they were, they were talking about a professor who was in the religion department and they said, I, I think he's a Christian, but I'm not sure. I said, oh, I'll find out. So we, we went to the Cone House together. I sent him an email. We met at the Cone House. And as soon as we sat down, I asked him, do you believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ? And he said, he said physical resurrection? Um, probably not. I said, okay, tell me your story said he was a Baptist evangelist, and then he went to the Harvard School of Divinity and to, to get his Ph.D., and I said, oh, stop right there. I'll bet I know what happened. You went into Harvard believing in the physical resurrection, and you came out not believing. And he sheepishly said, yeah, I, I guess that was the beginning of it. Another professor I had lunch with, I asked him the question, and he said, physical resurrection? Oh, of course not. It's a spiritual resurrection, not a physical resurrection. So so that gives you somewhat of the diversity of people's beliefs on this sort of thing. But you see what the Scriptures say, that in order to be saved, we have to believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead. That's what the Scriptures have to say. What else does it say? It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved. So here is the gospel by which a person is saved. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So in other words, there is a possibility to believe in vain. So we might believe in something, but it's in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He was raised... Um, and, the, and he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. So he says, I deliver to you as of first importance, the most important thing, Paul says, I'm telling you. This is the most important thing, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the most important thing. You may have your own pet philosophies, But what the Scriptures themselves say is the most important thing is the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. That He died for our sins, He was buried, and He was raised on the third day. And it talks about this, that it is possible to believe in vain. Then it goes on, he says, And He appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. And after that, He appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of all... 
most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. So then he says, he says he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, that Jesus appeared to Peter. Then he says, and then to the twelve, so he appeared to the twelve apostles after them. Remember, at this point, at this point, Judas had hung himself, but Jesus appeared to many people, and one of those extra people was Matthias, who was soon chosen to replace him. That's the twelve he's referring to, because Matthias took his place. That's Cephas and the other eleven, which makes twelve. Then he says he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. Most of them are alive. Some have fallen asleep. Fallen asleep is the code word in the Scriptures that means that they were in Christ, they believed, but they passed away. Jesus, remember, he referred to the little girl Tabitha, oh, she's not dead, she's asleep. Lazarus is not dead, he's asleep. That meant that Jesus very much believed that this was a state that was not a permanent state, that there was still life. To people who did, who did not believe on Jesus, he spoke of them as being dead. So these people who had seen him had fallen asleep. They believed on him. But look at what he's doing. He's saying, here is the evidence. Here are the people. Cephas, the twelve in total, believed. And then there were 500 people at one time. Hallucinations are not shared. A person may hallucinate. Another person may hallucinate at another time. You don't have... Two people hallucinating the same thing at the same time doesn't happen, let alone 500. So he's building a case here for the evidence. And look what he says. He's giving us the names and who they are. He says, James, he's giving us the names. Check it out. Check it out. Here are the people. The people were still alive, most of them. You don't believe? Ask the people. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how does... How do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Again, if there is no resurrection of the dead, our faith is in vain. Preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. So if a person thinks that they are a Christian and they don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, might they fall into that category? You be the judge. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. You see what He's building here? If we are going to say that we are Christians, there is a resurrection that is really, really important. And so, do the Scriptures speak of it in this way? And obviously they do. Alright, is it a physical resurrection? In John chapter 20 it says, But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands, the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Okay, so the other disciples saw Jesus after he had risen from the dead. Thomas happened to not be with them at the moment that Jesus appeared to them. He wasn't with them. Now, this guy Thomas was really influential. Jesus had told them all to go up to the Galilee. That's about 50 miles north of Jerusalem. He told them to go there. But they didn't go because this guy, Thomas, was not convinced. For eight days, he held them there. He says, I'm not going to believe. He says, he said to the other disciples, he says, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my fingers into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Jesus was stabbed in the side, it says, when he was on the cross. He says, I want to put my hand into his side. Unless that happens, I'm not going to believe. Does that sound to you like someone who's trying to believe? Like saying, oh, I've got to believe, I've got to believe. No. I mean, this is a typical skeptic. Unless I stick my finger into the holes in his hand, stick my hand into his side, I'm not going to believe. This is actually what a normal human being should say. Somebody says, hey, you know, somebody ri- rose from the dead. Oh, yeah, sure. Let, let, let me... Let me touch the guy. Let me poke him in the eye. Let me do something to make sure. (laughs) Thomas was not wanting to believe. After eight days, his disciples were 
again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be to you. This peace be to you. This is Shalom Aleichem, the same greeting, greeting that's used today in Israel. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here your finger and see my hand. And reach here your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. Then Thomas, Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. So Jesus appears to them. He says, Hey, Thomas, here I am. Come here. Put your hand right there in the hole. Now, take your hand and stick it right here in the hole in my side. Come on. Go in deeper. Feel that heart beating around in there? Come on, Thomas. You think Thomas goes, okay. <laughs> Jesus is saying, come on, do it. This is a physical resurrection. Jesus is putting to rest spiritual only. Physical. I want you to touch me, he says. Put your hand into the hole in my side and touch me. It is not merely spoken of in the Scriptures as a spiritual resurrection. It is a physical resurrection of the dead. And I understand. We don't have a lot of data points on this. It's a miracle. It doesn't happen very often. You know, we think it would, be, would have been wonderful to have seen Jesus like that. But Jesus then said, Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. We are more blessed if we believe having not seen than having seen and believed. That's what Jesus said. Physical resurrection. In Luke chapter 24, it says, And while they were telling these things, He Himself stood in their midst, and He said to them, Peace be to you. Again, Shalom Aleichem. Just the normal greeting. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. And He said to them, "Why Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? So they thought they were seeing a spirit. You think Jesus wanted to leave it there? No. He wanted to make sure that they understood this is physical. He said, see my hands and my feet. That it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. I mean, look at this. Jesus said, come here. They, they, he, he said, touch me. Look at that bicep. Man. Come on. <laughs> touch me. It's me. I've got flesh and bones. Then just to really, do, he says, you got something to eat. I mean, what do guys do when they get together? Anything here to eat? <laughs> you got anything here to eat? They knew Jesus loved fish. Jesus was always multiplying fish. Fish and bread. Tuna fish sandwiches. The guy loved it. Give him some fish. If it's really Jesus, he'll love it. he loves fish. They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it. Why would he do that? You think, well, maybe he was hungry. Maybe he was. But to show them. Have any of you ever seen a spirit eat? Anybody? See? Nobody. You've never seen a spirit eat. Spirits don't eat. That's what he said to them. And so he showed, and then he he ate in front of them. This is a physical resurrection. Spirits don't eat. He demonstrated this to them. This is what he tried to get across. 